name Keep on pounding on heaven's door Let your knees wear out the door Don't stop believing This mountain's moving with just a little pain And your father hears every single word you're saying Don't stop praying Don't stop calling on Jesus' name Keep on pounding on heaven's door Let your knees wear out Let your knees wear out the floor Don't stop believing Cause mountains move with just a little faith And your father hears every single word you're saying Don't stop praying Amen Our God is so good and he hears every single prayer because he cares about what we care about, right? He's our loving father. So let's keep singing to him this morning.
worship you until the very end my savior my closest friend i will worship you until the very end you know god's word said that when we build our life on him it's like building our house on a firm foundation the winds of life can come the struggles the trials can come but we won't be knocked over because we've built our life on him, the solid rock. So this morning as we keep singing, we're going to sing about building our life on him and how important that is. So Gateway, as we sing this morning, commit your life to our King and say, God, I'm only building my life on your solid rock. Amen. Let's sing. song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you we live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Oh. No one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you.
shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. Let's hear your gateway for Jesus. Gateway, welcome to church. It's a great day to be in God's house, and we are so happy that each and every one of you are here with us today. We want to extend a special welcome to you if it may be your first time at Gateway today. We feel so honored that you chose to come and spend your Sunday with us, and our prayer is that if you don't have a home church of your own, you come back and join us again. If you are that guest, we'd love if you do us a favor and fill out what we call a Connect card. You can find one of those cards under the seat in front of you or on the table at the back of the auditorium. Simply fill it out and drop it in one of the giving boxes at the end of today's service. And also for our first time guests, we have a special guest gift bag for you. At the end of the service, you'll find a friendly gateway volunteer at a table at the southwest corner of the auditorium. Head there once the service is over and let them know it's your first time at Gateway today. Thank you for joining us. Make sure you're staying tuned to our online church calendar for everything that's going on at the church throughout the week, especially since now getting back into the fall season, we have new connect groups being added to our weekly schedule. You can find our calendar at gatewayonline.ca slash what's happening. Here are a few special dates for you to keep in mind. On Wednesday, September 18th at 10 a.m., our Book Reading Connect group is coming back after a summer break to start a new book called As It Was in the Days of Noah. This book parallels our current culture to the days of Noah. So come on out on Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. and there is a sign-up sheet for this Connect group if you're interested in joining in. You can find that sheet at the info desk following today's service. 
Also for all of you young adults ages 18 to 35, we are rebooting our young adults this fall. On Saturday, September 21st at 6 p.m. will be our very first young adults gathering. So come on out. It's going to be a great time of fellowship, getting to know other young adults in the church. Once again, that's Saturday, September 21st at 6 o'clock for ages 18 to 35-ish right here at Gateway. We have another water baptism celebration coming up this fall. You know, God's word tells us that when you receive Jesus as your savior, we are to follow that up with water baptism, which is a public profession of our faith in Jesus. So if you are a believer in Jesus, have received him as your savior, are age eight or older, and have never been baptized by full immersion in water, then this is for you. You can sign up today at the info desk following the service to be included in our next water baptism. Date for this event will be coming very soon soon, so keep your ears open. Now that fall is coming and we are getting back in the swing of things following the summer season, here are some reminders for all of you Gateway parents about our Gateway Kids scheduling at our two services on Sunday. Please be reminded that in our 930 service, we currently have Gateway Kids for ages toddler up to the age of six. Both of these classes start at the beginning of the service at 930. So parents, when you arrive, you can take your kids ages toddler up to six directly upstairs and send them to their respective class. At our 11.30 service, we have Gateway Kids for ages toddler up to 11. Parents, please be reminded that our toddler to age six classes begin as soon as the service starts. So when you arrive for church, you can take your kids ages toddler to six upstairs to meet with the teachers. Our ages seven to 11 stay in the auditorium with us for worship and are dismissed to their class as soon as worship is finished. Thank you, Gateway parents, for keeping these times in mind. Also, it is a great help to us if you head on upstairs to pick up your kids as soon as the service is done and not leave our teachers waiting too long upstairs. Thank you for your kind cooperation. Thank you, Gateway, for giving into our mission of pointing people to Jesus and celebrating changed lives. It is because of your obedience to God's word and bringing your tithe into the local church that we are able to keep our doors open and keep pointing people to Jesus. You help us be the hands and feet of Jesus with our local missions partners and overseas partners in the Philippines, Cambodia, and Vietnam. There are four ways you can give today. The first is by giving in person. You can drop your giving in one of the giving boxes in an envelope at the end of today's service. The second way to give is by e-transfer. Transfers can be sent to gateway.donations at gmail.com. The third way to give is by giving online. You can head to gatewayonline.ca slash give and follow the prompts. And the fourth way to give is text to give. Simply text the word give to the number that's on the screen right now and follow the prompts. That's all I got for you, Gateway, so see you right back here next Sunday. Now would be a great time to silence your phones if you have not yet done so. That way we have a minimum of distraction during today's message. Thank you so much for doing that right now. Now, Pastor Brian, over to you for the last part in our series, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. All right, good afternoon, Gateway. Good to see your smiling faces. And if your face is not smiling yet, just give me time. Give me time to work on you. Amen. Today we are concluding our series on the theme of respect for authority. You know, any of you that have ever been in the military, you know about respect for authority. There was one young man who was a, a new recruit, and just, just a few weeks into their basic training, they had an open house at the base. Family members were invited to come. It was a hot day, and they had a lemonade stand. A couple of soldiers were posted there looking after the lemonade table. And the father of this new recruit, wow, he's, he's in a pretty good mood. He goes over to get a, a cup of lemonade. And they got a little, a little jar there for donations. And he stuffed a $50 bill in the jar as he walked, went to walk away with his, his cup of lemonade. And one of the soldiers that was sitting there at the table said, sir, would you, would you like some change or something? And, and this, this father said, listen, I do not want change. Number one, my son is now a soldier in the United States Army. Number two, he has short hair. And number three, a few minutes ago, he called me, sir, that is worth $50 and far more. <laughs> Folks, you cannot put a price tag on this thing called respect for authority. Come on, before we get into this preach, would you stand to your feet and would you boldly repeat after me, I love God. Therefore, I love the Word of God, the teachings of Jesus, 
are my greatest counsel. My pride and passion is to follow his example. See, the Bible is truth to my spirit, joy to my soul, and health to my body. Help me, Lord, to know the book and walk the walk. Amen. Come on, somebody give some praise to the one who is worthy of all praise. He is why we are here. You may be seated, and just a quick word of welcome to those who are joining us online after the fact. Thank you so much for caring enough to want to catch up on what you missed in the service today. All right, so this is our final segment of this series called R-E-S-P-E-C-T. You know, there's no getting away from, you know, those who are in positions and roles of authority. It's all over the place in life, right? As we say, those who are large and in charge. There's parents, there's teachers, there's police officers, there's employers, pastors. What about that? Politicians, even the crosswalk guys. Hey, school is back in. And so when those crosswalk guards are, are, are coming out there with their little stop sign and, and they're stopping the traffic, you gotta, you got to obey those crosswalk guards so that the kids can cross the street safely. Amen. We submit ourselves to those who have been appointed to positions of authority and leadership, but there's, there's just no getting away from authorities and rules and those who enforce rules. So in week one of this series, we talk about respect for God. Come on, that's a given, right? Respect for God. And then out of our respect for God flows respect for so many others of these leaders that we have to do with in life. So in week two, we talk about respect for mom and dad, of course. We, we follow that up in week three with respect for the boss at work and certainly the teacher at school. Then week four was respect for spiritual leaders, yeah, pastors and Christian mentors. Week five, that was last Sunday, we began to talk about respect for government or not. You know, one time there was a guy that approached me after the service. I can't remember what I preached about, but he, he said, Pastor, I just love controversial subjects. <laughs> So today, I want to pick up where we left off last Sunday. So this is kind of part B of part five of our series. And if you were not here last week, you can certainly go online and get yourself up to speed. But if you were here, you'll recall that we were in Romans chapter 13, where the Apostle Paul makes a strong case for respect for God's authority that is invested in human government leaders, Christian or non-Christian, all authority flows from God, and that is true of government leaders as well. Something in our flesh, something in our natural person may not want to receive that, but nevertheless, it is the word of the Lord. And so we, we add our amen to Romans 13. We have respect for government. We have respect for leaders who are in authority. However, everybody say however. however. Yeah, you see, in theology... We, we, we say that the, the best way to study a scripture is by comparing and cross-referencing it with the rest of, of what the scripture has to say as well. And so, yes, we, we do respect government, but when we compare the scriptures that tell us to respect government with a whole lot of other scriptures where we see examples of Bible characters who did not obey government, and when we put that all together, we can conclude determined that when government is taking a position that is contrary to what we know to be the will of God in a given situation, then we do not obey government, but we have license to resist those powers that be. You, you see, the object of the game is to allow the Holy Spirit to produce in us a healthy balance of respect for government, yes, but without violating our respect for God. Remember last week, we made reference to Mark chapter 12, where the religious leaders came to Jesus with a trick question, and, and they said, is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar? In other words, to the, the Roman government, and, and, and Jesus said, well, listen, whose image is on your coins? 
They said, well, Caesar's. And Jesus said, well, then give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's, right? Pay your taxes to the government. Pay your tithes to God, and it's all good. So we, we have respect for government and respect for God. You know, one day in a Sunday school class, a teacher said, now, boys and girls, can anybody tell me who Caesar was? Do you know who Caesar is? And one little boy put his hand up and he said, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure that he was the dude that invented salad. <laughs> nice try, Junior. <laughs> but you see, Jesus taught respect for Rome, respect for government, okay, but, but, but that only goes so far because after Jesus returned to heaven, having accomplished his earthly mission, you may know that, that the New Testament church came under fire. They came under some considerable persecution, and, and these Jewish Christians, they refused to confess that Caesar is Lord. Rome was mandating that everybody in the Roman Empire, you must confess that Caesar is Lord. But these New Testament Christians, they weren't having anything to do with that because they would see that as a betrayal of their main confession, which is Jesus is Lord. So the point is, yes, we respect government, but first and foremost, we pledge our allegiance to Jesus. Come on, give me a strong amen. I know that's your heart. So how do we walk it out, and how do we work it out in real life? Well, five ways, and three of them we, we covered last week, and the other two we're going to pick up on today. And so first, just a quick review. So last week, you may recall, number one was view. View government and politics from a spiritual perspective, not just from a natural mind, but from, from, from a spiritual, a biblical perspective. So we're not seeing government and, and seeing politicians, you know, from, from, from the, the, the mind of a disgruntled taxpayer. No, no, that's not the perspective that we want to have. We want to view government not as a citizen, but as a Christian. Amen. Number two was pray. Pray for elected officials, right? James 5, 16, it says, The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. In other words, it's not all for nothing. When you pray, something is shifting. Something is happening. Prayer works. He is still the God who answers prayer. Somebody say amen. amen. So listen, if that's true of one person, imagine how effective it can be for multiplied thousands of men and women to get their faith in gear and to be earnestly interceding, calling on the Lord concerning what government is, is trying to do in our generation. Folks, it is our responsibility as Christians to pray for government leaders. Just turn to your neighbor right now and say, it is not a lost cause. Amen. There is hope. And then number three, it was this. Vote. Vote from a Christian perspective, right? You vote for the candidate who best represents our conservative Christian values. Remember, you're not, you're not so much voting for a person or a political party, although that's what will be listed on the ballot on election day, but you are actually voting for biblical truth and for the party and the person that best represents these precious, powerful truths that are in the Word of God. That's what we're voting for. We're voting for God's truth. Somebody say amen. amen. See, for many people, their view of government is strictly through a financial lens. Don't do that. You know, someone suggested that the government should, should come up with a revised, simplified income tax form. You know, just, just four simple points. Number one, how much money did you make last year? Number two, how much were your expenses? Number three, how much money did you have left over after you paid your expenses? And number four, please send the rest of it in right away. <laughs> Folks, don't let your opinion of government be merely financial, but see government and politics through a spiritual lens. All right, that brings us to today. Let's try to cover two more points about respect for government, at least as much as is possible. So you got your view and your pray and your vote. Number four is understand. Everybody say understand. 
You have to get to understand where this is all heading towards. You see, according to God's prophetic timeline and according to the warped agenda of the one world government system of the Antichrist, where we are headed toward is worst government ever otherwise known as the great tribulation under the regime of the Antichrist himself. But the good news is that government will be overthrown and replaced by best government ever, otherwise known as the millennial reign of Christ. Oh, we so look forward to that. Yeah, the word of God has given us foresight. We got these, these prophetic previews that are they're all laid out in the book. If we'll just be students of Scripture. You know, there was one man who went to a psychic, but when he got there, the sign on the door said closed due to unforeseen circumstances. <laughs> Listen, if a psychic says, I didn't see that coming, you know he's a fake, right? <laughs> By the way, don't ever inquire of a psychic. Don't read the horrible scope. Get your guidance from the Lord. Amen. You see, it is good to, to, to have an understanding of how this is all going to shake down. We don't just take life as it comes from one day to the next. No, we read ahead in the book and we know what's going on, what's coming down the track. So important to understand where this is all heading. Folks, when you are introduced to Jesus, you know, maybe somebody starts talking to you about the difference that the Lord has made in their life. You should try Jesus on for size. You know, somebody's getting in your ear with some gracious words of, of witness, or maybe they're inviting you to come along with them to church so that you can discover more of what it means to, to become a bona fide, born-again Christian. But somebody's outlining the simple terms of the gospel, right? And, 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 and you, you, you come to understand what they're, they're talking about, and you see, it's, it's, it's like the Bible. Bible says, I have bad news and I have good news. Now, this is the simple terms of the gospel. The bad news is Adam and Eve got us all into trouble. I mean, Romans chapter, chapter 5 couldn't be any clearer. It says, based on one man's actions, right, the original sin of Adam and Eve, the entire human race is pronounced guilty in the sight of God. We are born in need of a Savior, right? But the good news is that Jesus came later on. And that very same chapter 5 of Romans says that based on the actions and the righteous, righteousness of one man, that would be Jesus. All of us, all of us that were, that were uh, so tainted by the bad news of that original sin, right? The fallen human nature, it has filtered down through every successive uh, generation of the human race. We've all, we've all felt the evil effect of the sin factor. And so we stand in need of a Savior until somebody gets to us with the gospel. So the bad news is Adam and Eve ruined it for all of us. The good news is Jesus later on came on the scene and man, he laid his life down as a ransom, as a payment for sin. The judgment of God concerning the sin of the entire human race was all dumped on Jesus at the cross. And the father said, that's good enough for me that Jesus has, has substituted himself as a sacrificial lamb on behalf of, of people like those guys at Gateway in 2024. And the father says, I am so willing to just reinstate people in my family if they will simply regard what my son Jesus accomplished for them with his death and resurrection. Man, when we wake up to the fact that, hey, I need a savior, Jesus. I need to be spiritually reborn. So what am I waiting for? Please, Lord, would you come into my life? Be my savior. I'm ready to follow you from now on. My goodness, when we make that intelligent decision to be born again. Wow, there's a whole lot of things that, that come in, in, into focus, and, 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 uh, and the gospel will shed so much light for us on so many subjects, and uh, my goodness, he is all about changing us 
for the better. You're going to like the new you better than the old you. But one of the ways that, that we're going to be changed when we start walking with the Lord, in fact, the, the, the more you, you get to know Jesus, the more you show up in church, the more you dig into the Word of God, my goodness, the more you become aware. How many of you have gained this awareness since you became a Christian? You become acutely sensitive to the fact that, hey, Jesus is coming back. We're not just doing life oblivious to the fact that our Savior will return. It may be much sooner than you think. Come on. How many of you know exactly what I'm talking about when I say the deeper you get into this Christian experience, the more aware you become. Jesus is coming back, and it's sooner now than it's ever been before. He will return. But have you also discovered that it's not just quite as straightforward as, well, one of these days. Jesus is coming and he's going to rapture the church out of here and he's going to take us home to heaven and we will all live happily ever after. Now listen, as true as that is, there's a whole lot more that, that is going to be happening surrounding this event of Jesus' return. And listen carefully, the government will be a key factor when this whole thing to, begins to unfold in the, in the last days of the last days when the signs of the times are becoming coming really intense and you just know Jesus is coming back real soon when the when this stuff all begins to happen just like Jesus told his disciples when they inquired of him in Matthew chapter 24 they said hey what's going to be going on on the face of planet earth just prior to your return and Jesus laid out some really infra interesting information there Matthew chapter 24 you might want to study that one for yourself but but listen when all of this begins to happen. Government will be a key factor. So I can't go into all of the, the detail this morning or this afternoon, but if I did that, we'd be here all day reading chapter after chapter after chapter. But allow me to give you just a capsulized version of Bible prophecy. So the next major event on, on God's calendar is what's known as the rapture, right? First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, when, when Jesus comes back, I mean, he's, he's coming to receive everyone who is is a born-again believer, otherwise known as the church, right? When the rapture occurs, Jesus will come, and the church is going to be whisked out of here. Somebody say, I'm out of here. Yeah, that's exactly what rapture, the word rapture means plucked out. He's coming back and he's taken us home. We are his bride. And, and yeah, for sure, I'm out of her. That's exactly what we are going to experience. And so we're going home to heaven. And then there will be this event known as the judgment seat of Christ. Relax. It's a judgment that relates to rewards, not punishment. But every believer is going to be answerable to the Lord for, for what we did with what he gave us to work with. So the judgment seat of Christ going on in in heaven shortly after the rapture. But meanwhile, back on planet Earth, shortly after the rapture of the church, the Antichrist is going to come to power. He will not be wearing a hat that says, I am the Antichrist. He's going to be a very charismatic individual, not, not in the Pentecostal sense, but in the political sense. I mean, the Antichrist starts out, he is such a smooth leader. He will gain an amazing international following, and he's going to establish a, a peace treaty with Israel at the beginning of that seven-year period known as the Great Tribulation. And I mean, he's going to have the world just eating out of his hand. Everybody's going to think, that this guy is the best thing since sliced bread, and so the Antichrist, he's going to rule for seven years during the period known as the Great Tribulation. Good thing it wasn't eight years, eh? Seven-year tribulation. If it was eight years, some of our American friends would be thinking, oh, no, the Antichrist is going to be a two-term American president. <laughs> Relax. Yes, relax. But it's seven years, not eight. But for seven years, it's going to be a one-world coalition government that starts out sounding real good. But three and a half years into that tribulation period, the beast 
That's one of the names that the Antichrist is referred to as in the Scripture, the beast. He's going to break his covenant, his peace treaty with Israel. And then he is going to be revealed. So halfway through the tribulation, the Antichrist will, will be revealed for who he really is, a truly nasty character, just a maniac that defies description. The Bible calls him the king of fierce countenance. It also refers to him as the man of sin, the son of perdition, and the beast, as I mentioned. He's also called the vile person and the wicked. I mean, this is a bad... This a bad, bad leader. Folks, if you were to read Daniel chapter 7, also 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 13, Revelation chapter 16 through 20, if you, if you went through those chapters, you would see the portrait of a madman. Like the devil incarnate. But when, when you read the book of Revelation, side note, when you read Revelation, you always bear in mind, it is not the revelation of the Antichrist. It is the revelation of the Christ, Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. But still, folks, the government of the Antichrist is a reign of terror. I mean, he is bad, bad to the bone. Now, in case you were wondering, because the question has often been asked, Will people still have a chance to receive Jesus if they miss the boat? You know, if they miss the rapture, will there be a second chance? You know, I got to tell you about this one lady. She bought a new puppy dog, and, 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 and she starts training this dog because this little guy, when she would go away and be, you know, out of the apartment suite all day at work, and then she'd come home, and invariably, he would have chewed up some household item, and this is getting real annoying, is that she's trying to train him, you know, not to be chewing things up, but, but sure enough, she went off to work one day, she came home, and she got in the door, and there's, there's little bits of paper scattered all over the floor. Turns out, he had chewed up a book that she had been reading that was on her night table. You know what the title of the book is? left behind. <laughs> that little puppy's trying to send a message to, to his master. <laughs> oh, how, how, are you familiar with that, that book series, Left Behind? Man, if you want to acquaint yourself with some of the events that the scripture outlines that have to do with the time when the Lord comes back again, that's a great, that's a best-selling book series, The Left Behind series. But still, let's come back to this, this question. Will there be a second chance? You'll be glad to know. The answer is yes. Not that you're going to have to put this into practice. I do not recommend that you, you know, kind of, kind of stick around and wait and wait and wait and say, you know what, I, I'm, I'm going to wait and see if this stuff really is true. And, 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 and if it turns out that, you know, my, my, my friends and my family do get raptured out of here, then I'll receive Jesus afterward. No, I do not recommend that. It's very, very rough going during the tribulation period. And so, but the answer happily is yes. There will be so many people in Israel that finally will turn to their Messiah. In fact, 144,000 Jewish evangelists spreading the word. But in addition to the people of Israel, there will be so many people from so many other nations that will be uh, waking up to the fact that they need to trust Jesus and they will put their faith in him. The Bible refers to them as tribulation saints. But sadly, so many tribulation saints will become tribulation saints martyrs. Why? Because the government of the Antichrist is, is going to be mandating this little thing called the mark of the beast. Let's read about that. Revelation chapter 13 from verse 16. It, it also, that is the, the Antichrist government, also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the n number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. That number is 666. Obviously, we are heading to in that direction. We're, we're moving toward a cashless society, digital currency. Surely, nobody here has been living under a rock and are oblivious to the fact that as we speak, 
That system is coming into place. A one world economic system under the control of a one world government. It is happening. Whatever you do, don't ever take the mark of the beast. But we do believe that before that mark is implemented, the church will be out of here. But the government of the Antichrist will so be characterized by a strong spirit of deception. In fact, he's going to exalt himself, the Bible says, as God. And what's even more bizarre is that so many people will believe that and they will worship him accordingly. Read it for yourself. Revelation chapter 13, verses 3 and 4. And listen very carefully. The evil climax of this tribulation is the battle of Armageddon. That's when the nations are going to converge on the Middle East and they're going to gang up on Israel. And that, my friends, is when Jesus will return and he will come to the rescue of Israel. So this will be part two of the return of the Lord. So earlier on, seven years earlier, part one of the Lord's return when he raptures the church. And then seven years later, Jesus comes back again and he is going to decisively settle the matter once and for all battle of Armageddon will be will be done when Jesus comes back Revelation chapter 19 he's going to be riding on a majestic white horse and so are you did you know that yeah, when Jesus returns to, to put an end to this, this world war called Armageddon, it says that the saints, that would be you and I, we are coming with him as backup. We also will be riding our horses. Don't anybody give me that. Well, but I'm afraid of horses. Can't I just stay behind in heaven while they go on this little excursion back to earth? No. You're coming. You're coming along. Listen, when you get to heaven, all fear will be stripped out of your system. You're not going to have fear of horses or fear of anything else for that matter. You are going to be doing some horseback riding on that day. Whew, the power of Jesus is going to be so awesome. So the government of the Antichrist is coming. It is an absolutely reprehensible government system, a very sad season on the face of planet Earth, and yet there will be many people that will buy in. I mean, his government is pure evil, but so many people will go right along with it. Unbelievable. But here's what I want you to see. I don't know if that tribulation is in our very near future or in the very distant future, although the signs of the times would certainly suggest that it's much sooner rather than, than later, but we need to understand. Again, everybody say, understand. understand. We've got to understand. Listen carefully. Understand what is happening between now and then, between current life on planet Earth and the time when Jesus will rapture the church and then the Antichrist will set up shop and establish his tribulation government. What's going to be happening between now and then? Folks, can you see that our current governments on planet Earth are conditioning us? They are preparing us to readily accept the form of government of the future, a government that is so godless. That is exactly where this is all headed. Now, please allow me to qualify this entire message, in fact, this entire series by saying this. We are not against government. I'm preaching to you that as much as possible, we need to respect government. Government is not bad. On the contrary, government is ordained by God. It is divine order, right? Romans chapter 13. In fact, over the years of church history, there have been many heroes of the Christian faith who have occupied some, some lofty positions, some powerful positions of human government, and they have done great exploits and, and influenced many for righteousness out of a position of human government. So government can be a wonderful thing. Many of of the people in Gateway even work for the government. Government is good. Can you give me an amen on that one? Amen. 
Yes, Lord, help us as much as possible. So help us, Lord Jesus, to have respect for government. Unless the government is leading us astray. Amen to that as well. God give us a keen sense of discernment. You see, we don't, we don't uh, have to have a gift of discernment in order to realize there's so much that goes on behind the scenes. I mean, that goes behind, on behind the scenes, humanly speaking, in government circles. But also that goes on behind the scenes in the spiritual realm as powers of darkness will, will exact their influence in manipulating human government leaders. So much goes on behind the scenes that you and I, the average individual, never hear about in the news. But so much of this is available to us through prophetic revelation. God, show us the things that we would be wiser for knowing. But increasingly, we're going to feel the effect of, of cancel culture. Yeah, that's certainly going on between now and the tribulation, right? The Christian faith is under attack. They will try to stamp out the church if they can, but you and I are not going to let them, right? Right? Amen. See, they're trying to put their foot on conservative Christian values, biblical values. They're trying to incriminate the Bible as some kind of hate literature. You and I know better. The Bible is a love letter. But nevertheless, human governments will be tightening, ever tightening their restrictions upon the Christian community. They'll be trying to strip the church of, of her non-taxable charitable status. And, and on and on it goes, right on down the line. I cannot take time this afternoon to, to list some of the, the various ways that the government is trying, trying to, to put restrictions, unfair, unrighteous restrictions on the Christian movement. But, but let me say this. We are to respect government authority, except when they are infringing on our spiritual rights and freedom. So we understand the direction that this is all heading in. It will be increasingly difficult to respect the laws of the land. Lord, help us to walk in wisdom, to walk in love, to walk in respect, but also to walk in defiance if and when that is necessary. See, we will not compromise on the truth. I said we will not compromise on the truth. Pastor Brian, how long do you think we have before things get really intense like, like what you describe will be happening in the, in, in the, the period known as, as the Great Tribulation? I don't know how long between now and then, but what I do know is that between now and the Tribulation period, you can expect that government will increasingly flex their political muscles against the church, which brings us to our fifth and final final point of application. Number five is this. Prepare. Everybody say prepare. prepare. Yeah. Prepare to exercise civil disobedience if necessary. Just turn to somebody and say brace yourself. Something is coming down the track. Something is coming. Now listen. I am not a radical. I am not an insurrectionist. I am, I am not a conspiracy theorist. But neither am I willing to bow down to government policies that we know very well are contrary to God's policies. I'm not bowing. Remember Daniel? He's in the land of Persia. You've read about this in, in the book of Daniel, chapter 6, right? And so no one was allowed to, to pray to any other god. Yeah, King Darius made a decree. Nobody can pray to any other god. Daniel, this includes you. Daniel's response was civil disobedience. Yeah, Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. It says, now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows, where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Just as he had always done. He didn't try to shut the window. 
He didn't say, well, I better do this real secretively now. No. He continued to be himself. He was not flaunting his faith in his God, but he wasn't hiding it either. We know the, the end of the story. They threw him in the lion's den, and the Lord conveniently sent an angel that just happened to be a lion tamer. Yeah. Boy, you got to respect this Daniel. And what about Daniel's three colleagues? Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three amigos? We read the record of, of their adventure in Daniel chapter 3 where King Nebuchadnezzar signed into law that everybody across the map, when they hear this certain music, they must bow down and worship this huge golden statue that Nebuchadnezzar had made of himself. It's just one great big island. Those three young men, they said, not happening. Not happening. You can play your music. But we ain't bowing down. You can throw us in your furnace if you want, but we are not bowing down. We don't worship any other God than the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's who we worship, and that's, that's, that's all we worship. Sure enough, they, they threw those boys in the furnace. Now, some of you that may be new around here, and once in a while you hear the worship team doing that song, and, and the, the words in the song may have captured your imagination. You're, 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 you know, you're singing, and, 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 and these, these, these lyrics come on the screen. He's been my fourth man in the fire, time after time. And you're sitting there puzzling, what in the world does that mean? He's been my fourth man in the fire. If you are not familiar with this particular Bible story, what you need to understand is that, that they did. Because those three young men, they, they defiantly refused to bow down to that idol. They threw them in the furnace. And what do you know? They hadn't been in there long when, when they looked and they saw there was, there was another guy that joined them in the furnace. It was the Son of God, the fourth man in the fire. Somebody say amen. amen. I'll tell you, there's another lady that did not go along with the government uh, mandate. Her name was Jochebed. Remember Jochebed? And she did not have a real high-profile career plan, but, but they used to teach her, you know, and, 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 and they would kid her about attending, you know, these basket-weaving classes. And then she was, she was paying attention in class, and it paid off big time, right? Jochebed, you know who Jochebed was. She was the mother of Moses. Oh, something rose up inside of Jochebed. She said, no, no. Oh, no, you ain't touching my baby. You are not killing my baby boy. I'll tell you, we, we need some more of that Jochebed spirit rising up in the church in our generation. Say amen if you know what I mean. You see, there are times when the law of the land directly defies the law of the Lord. Just turn to your neighbor and say, decisions, decisions. Yeah, I guarantee there's going to be times and situations where, where you know, the powers that be are, are, are suggesting, you know, thou shalt do this or else. And, 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 and you're, you're going to be thinking it over. and You're going to be saying, no, that does, that does not jibe with, with my understanding of the word of God. I am not doing it. They had decisions. Tough decisions in some cases. You see, if you know it's coming, and we do. Come on, we, we know this stuff is coming. It's here now, and it's only going to intensify. But if you know it's coming, you can be prepared ahead of time. You can make a conscious decision beforehand. Don't you think that I have thought this through? Come on. If the government is pushing some kind of legislation that, that is not compatible with the Word, I'm going to have to resist I might have to flat out refuse, but I'm going to, dis, I'm going to respectfully disobey. Right? Even if there are family and friends that are like, hey, this is the law. You, you have to go along with it. No, I don't. See, when Henry Thoreau, the famous philosopher, when he was put in prison for refusing to pay his tax, because he knew very well that that tax money was going to finance what he ca considered a really unrighteous war, so they put him in jail. He was visited in jail by his friend, the well-known author, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Got to love that name. Come on. Everybody say Waldo. Waldo. Yeah. So, so, so Henry Thoreau is imprisoned for disobeying 
the law of the land. He did not pay his tax on what he considered to be really righteous grounds. And so there he is in, in jail, and, and along comes his, his friend, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and, 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 and Emerson said to him, he said, Henry, what are you doing in there? And Thoreau responded by saying, no, Ralph, the question is, what are you doing out there? Right, you should be joining me in here. Where's Waldo? Waldo's on the outside. Where's he should be? On the inside. You see, what are you going to do if they start confiscating Bibles? Do you just hand over those several Bibles that you have in your possession? Or are you going to hang on to those things for dear life and just suffer the consequences, whatever that might be? Well, what if the authorities said, I'm sorry, but you have to shut the doors of your church be because of this monkey business, this, this, this monkey virus? Oh, yeah, I've thought it through, man. I, I'm, I'm prepared. I, I'm prepared. In the, in the case of government mandates, I, I say, they can arrest me if they want to. We're not, we're not shutting down the church. No, sir. I say, if you, you want to arrest me, do it on a Sunday morning. Officer, just come, come right up here on top of the platform and put those handcuffs on me. I want Mara to get some pictures of this. <laughs> I'm serious. If push comes to shove, are we going to be loyal to Jesus or what? Amen. Folks, the church must have a voice. We are not a doormat. I said we are not a doormat. We have a voice and we need to use it. It's not wrong to speak up and strongly express our disagreement if we just cannot go along with something that the powers that be are trying to enforce upon us. Our democracy is based on a system of a vocal opposition party. That's how government is supposed to work. There's supposed to be some opposition. Might as well be the church because they know what they're talking about. They got insight from the book. Titus chapter 3 verse 1 and 2. Consider what our attitude, our hard attitude should be if we do find it necessary to say, sorry, I can't go along with that. Chapter 3, verse 1 of the book of Titus. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good. Not to be ready to do whatever is contrary to Scripture, but to be ready to do whatever is good. To slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle toward everyone. So if we do need to disagree and even to disobey, we do so respectfully. We are not the ones who engage in violence protest but peaceable protest have you ever heard the parable of the poet here it is there was a famous poet who was a very outspoken critic of the king and the way the king was running the kingdom and so finally the king had heard enough and he sent his men to go and apprehend put this this poet under arrest and they brought him back to the castle and they assigned him to the dungeon and there he languished for years and one day the king, the king got it in his mind that he wanted to try his hand at poetry. And so the king started writing some, some poetry. And then he remembered, oh, yeah, we have that famous poet down in the dungeon. Is he still alive? And somebody said, yes, sir, he's still alive. And the king said, well, bring him because I want his professional opinion about my poetry. So bring him here so he can read my poems. So they went to, to retrieve this this famous poet. And, and, and when they were bringing him from the dungeon up to the king's court, they said, listen, the king is in a really good mood, so if you just give him a compliment on his poetry, uh, we are pretty sure that he will give you your freedom. So they brought this, this poet in, and, and, and there's the king, and the king shows him. He's got it all laid out there. Here's the poems that I wrote. I, I'd love to hear what you think about it. And the king is pacing back and forth while the poet is reading this awful poetry. And when he got done, he turned and was about to walk away. And the king said, hey, where do you think you're going? And he said, back to the dungeon. There's no way he was going to offer any sort of a compliment for poetry like that. Listen, 
in the tribulation. All you have to do is renounce Christ, take the mark of the beast, give the Antichrist a compliment, and it's all good. You can get through this thing and survive. I don't think any one of us in this room would want to go that route. But what about believers like you and I here and now? What about between now and the tribulation? All you have to do is just go along with what they're asking you to do and everybody will like you. I don't think any one of us wants to go that road. Folks, the issue of having respect for government or not, it all boils down to this powerful principle that is outlined in the book of Acts, chapter 5. Peter and the crew, they were warned to cease from all preaching. You remember, we looked at this last week in chapter 4. Peter and company, they were called up on the carpet. The powers that be read the riot act and said, don't you dare preach about this Jesus character anymore. Do you remember what their response was? They said, well, listen, whether we should obey God or obey you, that's what this is all about. And they said, sorry, you lose. <laughs> and they continued to go and preach about Jesus. And now the following chapter, chapter 5 same deal. It's like deja vu. Verse 28 says, the authority said, we gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. He said, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood, this Jesus. And Peter and the, listen up, Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. Somebody shout amen. I tell you, this is a phenomenal rule of thumb to live the Christian life by. We must obey God rather than man. And this is not just applicable to government leaders trying to tell us what to do and influence us in ways good, bad, or otherwise. This, this could be anybody. This could be family members. This could be colleagues at work. This could be some of the people that you consider your best friends. If somebody is ever trying to influence you to do something that you know very well in your spirit is not what the Lord would have you to do, don't go along with that person's influence. You must obey God rather than man. That calls for another amen. Folks, we got to take a stand. We're living in a time when we got to take a stand. We got to know who we are in Christ. We got to know our stuff. We need to know our Bible and we need to walk it out. So it's a season to take a stand. You can disown me from my family if you want to. You can fire me from my job if you want to. You can refuse to do business with me if you want to. You can unfriend me if you want to. You, you, you can cancel me out if you want to. But I will not disobey my God. I'm going to stick with Jesus. No matter what anybody else might be trying to tell me that's contrary to that. Come on, would you stand to your feet? Come on, this is, this is, this is the Word of God. We've got to hang on to it. We've got, we got to live up to it. We've got to do what we know the Lord wants us to do. I tell you what, I believe that every one of you in this room, I believe that you are men and women who respect government authority. But if the authorities are ever asking you to betray your beliefs, then I believe that you become men and women who have the courage and who have the grace of God to be able to defy those government orders. So help us, Jesus. In that day when the pressure is on, God's grace will be sufficient. Strengthen you to obey God rather than man. Here's what I want to do. I want to do a little exercise. Come on, if you know your Bible, you know that in the speaking of, of words, especially words of truth, there is a release of power. Something is shifting. Something is moving. Something is changing in the spiritual realm. Something is happening in the working of the Holy Spirit with the speaking of words from the mouths of people like you and I who know the truth and who are prepared to authoritatively speak it out of our mouths. 
That, that's, a, that's a true spiritual concept right there. That's, that's biblical. So here's what I want to do. I want us to affirm this, this word from Acts 5, 29. We must obey God rather than man. Are you with me? Are you with me? Come on. Everybody say, I must obey God rather than man. All right, we're going to section you off. Already you are sectioned off, and we're going to do this in groupings. And so, first of all, I'm going to ask this section, and then I'm going to ask this section. Not that anybody's trying to outdo anybody else. This is not a competition, but then I'm going to move along, and I'm going to give opportunity to this section of, of believers, and, and, then, and then last of all, the, these two sections over here. Come on, I'm going, to, I'm going to get you to declare, I must obey God rather than man. And then to follow it up with an amen. We need to do this with great boldness. I, I, I want you to give it your biggest, best, boldest faith profession. Are you up for this? Come on, there's a lot that hinges on this. There's a lot of stuff coming down the track. It might very well be in our generation. Do you realize that many of us in this room could very well be the ones that, that are the Simeon generation that we live to see the rapture of the church? How glorious is that? There's a lot going on right now, and there's a lot more that's going to be going on as we move forward in God's prophetic calendar of events and it's so important that we know what's coming and that we know who we are and that we're prepared to act on what we learn from this book. Somebody shout amen. amen. Come on everybody. I want to hear you. You say I must obey God rather than man. Can you say amen? That's pretty good. Come on. You guys over in this section I must obey God Rather than, Rather than man. Now seal it with an amen. amen. How about you guys over here? Do you believe that? Yes. Come on, everybody say, I must obey God. Yes. Rather than man. Yes. Amen to that. Yes. Hallelujah. And you guys over here, come on, team up together. Everybody say, I must obey God. Yes. Rather than man. Yes. Now say a strong amen. amen. Come on, everybody, give a, a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I declare that there is a marvelous release of the power of the Holy Spirit that touches every one of us in this room today, that every household that we represent, every workplace that we represent, every school, classroom that we represent, and certainly in this house of God, and all of our activities that we exercise are in, in, in this week, that as we go from the house of God, we will engage in so many many activities in so many different places in contact with so many different people and in all of this I believe that there is a beautiful beautiful manifestation of the Holy Spirit as we rise up oh Spirit of God rise up inside of every one of us that we are people who are so convinced spirit soul and body that we must obey God rather than man oh yes Lord so help us Lord to abide by the word of the Lord that we are ones who respect government yes we do unless government is telling us to do something that interferes with what we know you are telling us to do Lord that is our commitment so help us as we go from church today we believe we believe we totally believe that you are empowering us to live it out in the name of Jesus can you say amen? amen? Come on, would you just remain in an attitude of prayer for another moment because I cannot dismiss this service before we have prayed together the prayer of salvation. This is what it's all about. Come on, I believe that so many of you in this room that already know Jesus in your Savior, that your heart is you want everybody else to know the Lord too. Not only here in church, but wherever our travels take us this week. Man, we so thank God for our own personal experience of salvation, but, but we, we will encounter other people that do not know the Lord. And our heart must be that we want to see them 
become a child of God as well. Yeah. So here in church today, with every head bowed, with every eye closed, many of you already know the Lord is your Savior. But there may very well be a number of you here today that have never made that all-important commitment to say, Jesus, it's about time I became a born-again Christian. Please come into my life. So before we all pray this prayer of salvation together to seal the deal, a simple show of hands. My friends, if you know that you need to give your life to the Lord today or recommit yourself to Jesus today, just raise your hand wherever you are. Just give me a wave. Be bold about it. Yes, I see your hand right at the back. Thank you. And over here on my right. Thank you. I see your hand up front here. Good for you. You can put it down. I see your hand right at the back, sir. Thank you. Smart decision. You never regret the choice. Say, Jesus, from here on out, it's you and me. I will never leave you, and I know that you will never leave. Anybody else, before we all pray this prayer together, just boldly raise your hand. Say, I need the Lord. Pastor, I know I need to do this. Anybody else? Come on, church. Let's pray. Would you join me? Let's, let's pray this. Heavenly Father, of course I receive your gift of salvation. Thank you for Jesus, the lover of my soul. Jesus, I believe you died on that cross to deal with my sin factor. I'm asking you to forgive me for everything I've ever done wrong. Lord, I believe you rose from the dead to give me a brand new start in life. Cleanse me with your blood. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Help me to live out the Christian life with Holy Spirit boldness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, church. How about a vote of praise for our Savior? Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. So good to be in church this afternoon. Thank you so much for making the effort to be here. But listen, we're going to dismiss with a word of blessing in just one moment. But when we've done that, I want you to know this altar is open. If you need some personal one-on-one -on -one prayer for you, or for someone else that you know, by all means, come on up front, one of our prayer partners. We'll be only too happy to pray with you. Also, back at that southwest corner of the auditorium, that table is available. There's a person back there that would be only too happy to supply you with some great literature to get you going in your walk with the Lord. If you raised your hand a few moments ago, wow, congratulations. We are so happy for you. This is the start of something great. Oh, come on, church. As you go on your way from church today, may the blessing of the Lord be strong on your entire family unit. May you be led by the Holy Spirit. May you be compelled by the love of Jesus Christ. And may you be forever governed by this word of God. Can you say amen? amen. God bless you, Gateway. We will be officially dismissed. Thank you for joining our online service today. We pray that you were so encouraged by the worship and the message. And hey, if you've been blessed by the worship and the messages here at Gateway, we'd love if you partner with us. You can head to gatewayonline.ca slash give to do so. And if you're in the Regina area, we would love to have you join us in person for one of our services very soon. There's a chair here waiting for you. But if you're not able to make it in person in Regina, we'll see you right back here next Sunday for another Church Online.